um, that's fine. Let's just, yeah, let's just go ahead and start. I mean, because we're saying some pretty cool things um, just in the yeah. game room and chatting. But anyways, <laughs> guys, welcome back to another episode of Coffee and Van Chats uh, by the Out of Bounds Network. This is the first episode on the Out of Bounds Network. Uh, if you guys don't know what that is, um, go check it out. There's going to be a link in my description below. But we're doing big things. We're making big moves. And uh, we got, you know, 15-time national champion Katie Compton on the podcast, uh, which I'm super stoked about. I look up to Katie. I respect Katie a ton. Uh, and yeah, we, we all know the news and we've, we've read the media and we've seen it all. And, um, I have a thing with this and, uh, I don't know if I said this to Katie yet. Um, but being in the sport and being in a lot of this stuff, I'm into crime podcasts, Katie. Like I love, they're so I good. I fucking, love them. I fucking love, love them. crime podcasts. But at the end of the day, and I don't want to compare you to a serial killer, which is, this is probably bad. I'm probably, this is probably bad, but like, follow me here. Okay. Just follow me. <laughs> Oh my God, I've never, never had somebody say like, I don't yeah. want to get compared to Sierra Killer, yeah. but. <laughs> but but follow, but work with me here for a second, okay? Yeah. All right, so, I'm listening. At the end of the day, the only person that actually knows what happened on that day in that room is that serial killer. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I totally get it. And that's the craziest fucking thing to me because no matter how many times they tell the story, it's going to yep. get told different or it's yep. going to come down the pipeline different. And so- yep. Yeah, I, that's why I thought I would get you on this podcast to share your story and <laughs> in a safe space, in a place where you can still, um, you know, just, yeah, tell your story, tell your version of it. Um, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I've seen it on Velo News, I've seen it on Cycling News, I've seen it on USADA, I've seen it mm -hmm. on Mark Legg's page, you know, him trying <laughs> to do it all. You know, I've seen it all, yeah, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. The internet trolls suck, they don't make mm -hmm. shit any better. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, but anyways, let's dive into you as an athlete first. Mm -hmm. Let's dive mm -hmm. into your background. Where does Katie Compton become Katie Compton? Like, how does that all start? Oh, geez. Yeah, I know. I know this. And give That's... me like a brief synopsis, because for some people that don't know you, because we're on the Out of Bounds Network now, a ski podcast. Okay. Oh, some ski. Okay. Know, some people might not know who you are. Okay. Um. So, geez, I've been in sport my whole life. I've been racing bikes my whole life. Like, by my whole life being like. I started racing bikes when I was eight years old, um, race, race on the velodrome, mountain bike, cyclocross, um, road, road racing as junior national team, junior world's team, like national team for a long time. Um, I've just pretty much spent my life bike racing in some form, some way, same shape, some shape, um, whether I'm racing, whether I'm just doing it for fun, whether I'm just, uh, you know, doing it as a profession, I've just always really enjoyed riding my bike and I've done it forever and I love it. Um, sure. so that's pretty much me. Like you think about just been racing my bike for a long time. I was on the U.S. Paralympic team for, I think, I think, uh, four years at four or five years. Um, I was a pilot for a blind athlete on a tandem, wow. um, race Paralympic games in Athens, um, world championships, European championships, that sort of thing. Um, so I was fairly serious into that. And then I got into cyclocross, um, turned pro in 2007. Um, and then I've just been racing professionally since 2007. Um, mostly with cyclocross focused road racing a little bit, a little bit of track racing, um, a little bit of mountain biking, but, um, cyclocross is what I was always good at. I was naturally good at it. I had a sprint. I had, um, I could ride in a pack. Um, I had the skills from racing mountain bike. So it's kind of like, it was one of those skills where I wasn't a great sprinter. I was always like second or third on the track, no matter if point yeah. race pursuit, like match sprinting, whatever it was, I was never winning anything on the track. And same thing with the road. Like I won the road racer crit as juniors, but like for nationals, um, but like I was never great at any of it until I got to cyclocross and once cyclocross, it kind of combined, I was good enough sprinter, a good technical rider, a good enough endurance, good enough strength. Like everything was good enough but you put it all together and it made me a good, a great cross racer. So that's kind of what I fell into because I was good at it and I really enjoyed it. And then, you know, when you're getting paid to race your bike, um, you know, life's pretty good. Yeah. So that's thing, it in a nutshell. That's it. That is a big <laughs> nutshell because like yeah. you've been racing forever. But I, what I think is, what I think is really cool about your statement is that I wasn't really good at it. I got second. Um, ah, yeah, you, true. you know, it's like, true. I wasn't really that good at it. I only got second. Um, I wasn't a good, this, I wasn't a good that, but I mean, and we're talking about an era, especially in track cycling, we're talking about an era mm -hmm. where like Sarah hammer was just like, 
hundred percent on the track. And, and I mean, mm-hmm. that's who you're going to be facing. And I mean, well, yeah, yeah. Like the girls I race with, like we had probably the strongest group of junior girls come up through there. We had like uh, Jenny Reed, Karen world champ, um, Aaron Mirabella, um, Ryan Kelly. Uh, let's see. Tamaya um, or was that? Past- yeah. Tamaya was uh, a couple years stronger than I, Yeah, she's obviously one of the good ones too. Um, and then Marissa Vandeveld, Christian Vandeveld's sister. She yeah. was really great, really strong, great pursuiter. Um, so we had really good riders. Um, but like I say, it wasn't very good is because like, no matter what I did at junior nationals, I was second to a different person in every category. Yeah, so it's like, that gets real old real quick. It and like, I actually, old. yeah, it gets, it gets old real quick. Um, yeah. um, I know the feeling but, like, racing against Lambie. It's, it gets really, yeah. Great. You're just like, come great. on. Um, but like, I didn't win my first national championship on the track until C- Carrie Higgins and I won the Madison. Um, I don't know, so many years ago, f- maybe 2015 or 16 or something like that. Um, Wait, that but was that your, was awesome. That was, oh, so you're saying that was your first national title on the track on okay. the track. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like I've won a bunch of junior, like on the road, mostly, um, road and crit and then um u23 and then elite for mountain bike and cyclocross so yeah no so that's amazing i think like i said you know i've ridden with you on a group ride and i've you know on the group rides here in town and you know you're a very competitive individual great bike handler um all around experienced and everything and so you know you were probably known as one of the best and that's why this kind of hit the community i think pretty hard is one of the best mm-hmm. cycle cross racers america's ever had men or woman um, yeah and i still i yep. still kind of stand by that i still am like yeah yeah and i still, I still am. like I, I was about to say i still yeah. stand by that yeah um, i do too but like good. a lot of it is um so this positive control I don't even know if I believe it as a positive control. Um, that's a whole nother story we can get into, but like if anybody has seen my results this year, (laughs) or I'm just like, if I'm really, first of all, the test was in September when none of us were even planning on racing yet. Like I didn't even book anything for Europe until November. So I wasn't even really planning on racing. So like, why am I going to intentionally take something when I wasn't even planning on racing? And I'm pretty much end of my career. I've gotten the results. Like I could easily Trek was going to pay me to race another year or two. Like I didn't need results. Like that wasn't like something I needed. I just, just going to keep racing for the fun of it. Um, and Trek was going to pay me to do it. My sponsor were going to support me to do it. So there's no reason for me to need to get results. Um, but also like if you, if anybody ever noticed, like I raced awful this year, I've never been slower. Yeah. Like, and that's, I was, I was trying to figure out how to bring that up <laughs> and I'm glad you did because that's one thing that I wanted to bring up. It's like, I feel like you weren't the same Katie. So this can be taken one of two ways, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. were trying to finish out on a high note, but then I was like, well, I've won races before and I have not won maybe even a third of the races. Like I'm like, I'm not even close. Like I can't even like mine isn't even a third of the races that you've won. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. And so whenever I go out to these races and some of these rides and near the end of my career, I could see like, I have nothing to prove. Like, look, I've done it. I know what I'm doing. I know who I am. So to me, I don't see how that makes sense. Um, Mm -hmm. but that being the caveat, I can also see it from the other side of the thing. It's like, Oh, let's go out on a high note, you know, go Mm -hmm. out on the biggest note ever. And so let's back up a little bit. This all starts from a test in September. Mm -hmm. And mm-hmm. this was yeah. an out of competition test. So tell us a little bit about how that all went down mm-hmm. and, and, and kind of the story of this test. Okay. So I'll kind of give you the timeline of how things worked out and also okay. kind of explain my side of it. Um, Cause honestly, I haven't read anything online. I haven't read USADA's press release. I haven't responded to any, any, I just went pretty much been offline because right. I don't want to deal with it. Um, people who know me have reached out. They have my contact and those you know, the support has been amazing, like family, friends, it's been amazing. So that's like, I just want to put that out there. Like I feel loved by so many people. So that's been great. Um, September, I think the test was September 15th or 16th. Um, and that was, yeah. So I get out of comp out of competition year and test. So I'll say September 16th. Almost a year. Um, Almost a year. Yeah. Yeah. And then I got the 
result from that test in October, I think October 12th, I got the letter from USA that says like your, your sample's negative. Well, you know, the, yeah. the letter we all get after every sample we provide, it's like you get a negative results letter with usually within four weeks after testing. Did you ever, um, before you mm -hmm. keep going, did you, do you ever stress about those? Like those never. letters, never, never. Like you've gotten to a point at this point where it's like, I've done these so many times. Like I know I'm so many it. times, so many times. And I don't take anything. It's never a stress. Like dope yeah. control has never been an issue. Never been a stress because I don't take anything. Like yeah. I've never had to worry about any of it. And I never have, never do. So I don't save the paperwork. I throw it away as soon as they wow. leave. Like I delete the emails. Like I don't look at any and anything until I have to fill about, fill out my whereabouts every four, four, three, four months, whatever it is. Yeah. Pain in the um, ass. So yeah, totally. Finally out of that pool. Thank yeah, God it took yeah. <laughs> right on. <laughs> it took, you know, this whole scenario to finally get out of the testing pool. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, so I got that negative results letter in October, you know, throw that shit away. Don't even think anything of it. I got tested in October. I got tested in November, December, January, and then once in February, once in March, or maybe twice in February, once in March. I can't remember, but I've been tested numerous times since then in and out of comp. Um, and so raced the whole season in Belgium. Everybody know who, knows how, how that went. I think I was racing for 30th on my best day. Maybe I got like 20th on a good day. I don't know. It was so yeah. far back. I didn't count. And I, I was pretty miserable. And like, I got back from the season thinking like, I don't know if I can do this again. Like even December, Mark and I were having the conversation. It's just like, you know, I'm sucking. I'm not riding well. I'm putting a lot of effort into this, a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of time. And I'm racing for 30th. Like I was about to pull the plug anyways. And, but like you get back from Europe and you're like, well, just give it some time, you yeah. know, let this sit. Let's not make a decision now when I, when I'm hating racing, I'm hating my bike. I'm hating everything about it. Um, it's just wait a sec and then make a decision in a month or so. Yeah. <laughs> so I got back from Belgium, February 6th, I think. And then I got that letter from USADA February 7th or 8th. So it's like, I didn't even have time to like, you know, get home, relax, kind of think about things before I got that positive results letter from USADA. And so, so was it a letter in the mail or was it like an email? It was an email. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I, <laughs> I got it from, um, an email from like the athlete ombudsman at USOC. And I was just like about subject line, positive tests. And I was like, what the hell, what the fuck is this? Yeah. Super like, like this can't be right. And was then it I in your spam kind of like this. No, this it, was I, cause I feel like something <laughs> like that would be in spam. You know what I mean? Well, not cause it's like, I don't know if it's from USOC or from USADA cause USADA obviously doesn't because yeah. with their whereabouts and such, those emails always show up. Well, if a um, lawyer is reaching out to you, it's probably USOC. <laughs> it was yeah. USOC ombudsman. Okay. Um, just to kind of like, if I need help with my USADA situation, I was like, what USADA situation? What the shit is this? About? Like, it was oh, just, yeah. and I got this at like Sunday night at like nine or 10 o'clock because like, um, maybe it's Monday night. It was one, it was a night and I was just going to check my emails to see what coaching I had to do for the next morning. And then I was like full on panic attack. Like Fuck. my world just came on, came undone. You can't call anybody at that moment either. Like well, no, the, the yeah. ombudsman's asleep. Like he's, yeah just doing his job. Yeah. And so like you, you can't yeah. talk to anyone. You yeah. essentially have to, I don't know, like uh -huh. explain that moment. Like, what are you feeling in that moment? I think, cause like, I, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna lie. I don't get tested very often. And I got yeah. tested like six times at nationals this year and it stressed me the fuck out. <laughs> It just stresses me out, man. Yeah. Um, well, I've been so okay. You want to talk about testing? I I filled out paper whereabouts and mailed them in before we had the internet. That's uh, yeah, how long see, I've done whereabouts. Yeah, you haven't been. You had no need to be stressed. Like, well, that's the thing. Been, like, I, I mean, I remember my first open controls when I was fourteen, wow. and then I was in the out of competition pool from sixteen to eighteen on junior national team. So it's like, it's not it's not new to me being in the out of comp pool, and like. I've missed two tests since I was 18 years old. Okay. Like, I mean, that's how up to date I was with my whereabouts being in the out of comp pool for that long. I was in the Paralympic out of comp pool, the um, cyclocross out of comp pool. Um, like I've been doing it so long without yeah. any worries. Cause I never take anything. Like it's always been perfectly like fine. You've probably seen staff come and go and you're on a first name basis. Oh, for sure. Getting each other Christmas gifts and shit. Like you guys, you guys are, 
<laughs> you guys are next level. Um, well, the thing is, just so people know, you're not allowed to give your DCOs any like gifts or anything because oh, it's a bribe. Okay. So oh, you can't. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That well, pesky rule. Yeah, but yes, my, my DCO used to live in the neighborhood. He used to live oh. like a block away. So he could see if I, my car was there and if I come test me now or just like come a different time when he knows I'm home, like oh, outside wow. my one hour window. But yeah. like, I've been doing it long enough. Like you get it. Yeah. Yeah. I so get you've it. Been, you've doing it. You've been experiencing it. So you, you've come to a point where you probably don't even worry about the letters anymore. You just see them come in and you just toss them out. And so yep. now you have subject yep. line positive test. Is any part of you thinking it's a fucking joke? Like part of me would be like, is somebody messing with me? Like, yes. this is okay. no way. Okay. So we'll kind of go back. So on, in January, like Mark and I reached out to the ITA, which yeah. is the international testing association. They took over for UCI testing um, okay. for cycling and they may do other sports. I'm pretty sure just cycling. Um, but they took over for the CADF. Okay. I think some more independent. I think they took over January 1st, but we reached out to them to kind of give them an update of like how the doping's working in Belgium, like how European scenes working. We've had people come up to me and kind of give us information on how people are doping and how people are getting away with it. And like, wow. I was saying like, I'm done, I'm retiring. I'm not coming back to Belgium. I've got nothing to lose. Like, I don't give a shit about this anymore. If you guys want to tell me about doping stuff, I will just pass that on to whomever needs to hear it. And I can walk away. I don't have to deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. So we reached out to ITA with some information to give them. We had a discussion with them, a confidential conference call on January 26th about the doping in Europe and like gave them quite a bit of information. It was probably What's the an- date on that. January 26th. So this is January right 26th. before you get your letter. Okay. This is right before world championships, right okay. before this is like the Tuesday before world championships. Okay. On January 26th, you have this conference call like at three o'clock in the afternoon in Belgium. Um, and then on January, I think 29th, I have an out of competition test right before worlds and the DCO, the dope control officer who came to do the test was like, oh, glad to hear you're a friend of ours. And I was like, well, that's an odd thing to say because you don't really have any conversation with your, the dope control officer who shows up. You like, you don't even shoot the shit. You're so quick doing the testing that night. It's just a blood test that you can in and out to test all the athletes before world championships. Yeah. So like for a fact that that's the only thing he said to me the entire time, I was like, well, that's odd. How do you, first of all, know that we had a conversation with the ITA? Why are you telling me this? And it's been two days since we had that confidential conversation. Wow. Um, so that's January 20, 26th, the conversation, January 29th for the out of comp test with the, the DCO saying that to me. I raced worlds the next day. Okay. Everybody knows how sucky that was. Yeah. Um, I don't race again because I'm done and I don't want to do it anymore. I fly home. Um, I arrived February 6th. I get that letter from USADA. I think it was, I want to say um, February 8th because ironically enough, I had uh, another meeting with the ITA, a conference call recorded meeting with more people on February 9th. So the morning wow. after I get that letter from USADA with the, my negative test is now positive. I have to talk the ITA at seven o'clock in the morning to go over like everything I just told them. Wow. And so do they, yeah. do they have any <laughs> knowledge? Do they know this at this point? Because I think, right. I don't like think if you so. Have, if you have a positive test that stays within the Federation and between mm-hmm. everybody until yeah. like proven innocent until proven guilty, right? Like that's the whole thing. No, no, right? no, no. You're guilty until proven innocent with, with doping control. You're guilty until proven innocent. Yeah. So, so that's, why did it take so yeah. long? For, so why does it take so long for them to announce it? Right. So like you found out on February and then we get an announcement. Yeah. What, what is it? July something six um, months later. Yeah. Yeah. Because you so, tried to fight it, right? You tried I tried to, to fight it. it. I've uh, been trying to fight it since I got the letter. Okay. Um, so, and a lot of, because like, I don't know why. So I find it. So I talked to the ITA on February 9th, have a whole discussion, like, and keep on, I haven't slept the entire night because like yeah. I've been up stressing and like thinking about shit, what am I going to do? How'd this happen? Like, what the hell? And then I was like, great. I lose sponsors. I lose reputation. Like I need money. Like everything, the world just falls apart and just got to yeah. figure out how to 
how to fix it, how to put out the fires and like, you know, keep shit going. Um, but like, I was like, wait a second, this is awfully coincidental because by the time I got the paperwork with my positive test, my positive result from the September test, it was also opened on January 26th in the laboratory in LA at the end of the day. So a nine hour window between Europe and LA that gives somebody who was on that conversation or somebody in that, who was on that conversation to pass on that information to get them to reopen my tests in LA on the same day I spoke with them to give wow. doping information. So it's like, I, I've been giving negative samples for my entire life. Yeah. And the day I talked to the ITA to give them anti-doping information is the day my negative sample gets reopened and comes back positive on January 26th. It's weird. Like, yeah. I mean, it, okay. Yeah. That could be coincidental. You saw it. I was like, Oh, that's coincidental. That's, that doesn't happen. I was just like, I don't know. Have you guys looked into it? Is there any oversight like in the labs? And I also find it interesting that like my, um, that was the last sample I gave in the Behringer bottles. Every sample I gave after September was in the new tamper proof bottles. Yeah. So it's like, if they're going to tamper with the sample, the only one they can tamper with is that September 16th sample in the Behringer bottles. Yeah. So that's also super interesting. Yeah. Um, I, th I think one thing that that's yeah. really kind of standing out to me too is, um, you know, you know, if we, if we backtrack just a little bit in the sense of, okay, you know, you've been doing this for ages. We, we've had this conversation of where you started yeah. and how many, how much testing you've been doing. And, yeah. um, like it's one of two things, right? Either you've been doing it forever and you fucked it up this one time. <laughs> and I this just one don't, time. <laughs> I, that's, that's kind of interesting to me. It's like, wow, you've nailed it every time. And this is the time you decide to fuck up Katie. Yeah. Like, I've really? nailed it for 20 years. Yeah, fucking you dialed it in. Yeah. Except, except world championships. I have yet to fucking get that dialed in to get yeah. second. How many times? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But and then that's the thing. It's like, you've dialed yeah. everything in. So if you've been doping for this long, why all of a sudden did you mess up this one test and timing? And then, so that yeah. doesn't make sense to me. Another thing is too, is yeah. I want to ask you doping information. You keep claiming that you're yeah. giving this information to the, to the, uh, ITA. And I don't mm -hmm. think you need to give much more, but kind of explain to me what kind of information, because like the way I'm hearing this and the way maybe our listeners are hearing this, I'm just hearing yeah. doping information. So like, are you like okay. going in depth with names? Like, are you saying like, you know, X person is told me this, this, and this, and this person is doing this, this, and this, and you need to check these people. Or are you saying, mm -hmm. Hey, I've heard of this new method. You should probably look into it. Like how in yes. depth are you going? You see yes. what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. So I've given doctors names. I've given riders names. Whoa. Yes. I've okay. given, I've given ways they do it. I've explained the way they do it. And I get this information from valid sources. Wow. It's not like I, I wouldn't come to it would just be like, I have a hunch. No, so this is, there's a yeah. potential chance that you're taking down an operation in theory, like almost you think so. like, well, and that's, you know, it's one of those things where I know shit operates. I know there's a black market. I know there's yeah. a, like the mafia behind their merit, their merit or stuff. The yeah. shit's real. Like people, I think outside the sport want to believe everything's clean. Any cyclist within this sport, any bike race in this sport, any person in management within the sport knows what the reality is. Yeah. Um, the doctors are smart. The doctors are far ahead of testing. Testing, I don't think works that great. Um, I don't think, I mean, I'm a clean athlete. I didn't take anything. I don't care what people believe. Like I know, I know the truth. I know I didn't take anything. I know I'd never intentionally do it because it's cheating. Yeah. And it's also not great for your health too. Like yeah. there's a variety of reasons why I would never dope. But like cheating is one of the major reasons and the moral and moral and ethical part of it. Yeah. Um, but it also it messes up your hormones for life. Like there's so many negative events to doing it. It's just, what's the point? It's bike racing. Who gives a shit? You yeah. know, like the results come and go and you might feel really good about yourself for a day, but do you really feel good about yourself when you won? Not like, honestly, like, yeah. I don't know. Like, I'm trying to help the sport. That was one thing where just like, I'm willing to put myself out there to make things better. 
and you've never done that before. Like you've never, no. like, cause there's a few athletes. Like I think Mandy Marquardt is a, is a great mm -hmm. example. Like she's behind mm -hmm. USADA. She's does the whole clean mm -hmm. athlete initiative. And like, she really yep. pushes that shit. And I know there's yep. a few athletes that really, really push that kind of shit. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, I never known you to be that. Um, and so mm -hmm. I guess I see you leaving the sport and I'm hearing the story that essentially you went to the mm -hmm. ITA and now, mm -hmm. now we're hearing the doping information is more like you're mm -hmm. given names, like you're, you're, you're pretty much telling who, who's doing what, where, mm -hmm. when. And mm -hmm. so that's interesting. And so that changes the game completely because how <laughs> have you in the, in the, in the amount of time that you've been tested, because they said this to me when they tested me at track nationals. Yeah. Yeah. How often have they retested your samples? Because don't they have to contact you and give you the opportunity to be able to stand there in person or some shit? Uh, I don't know. Okay, so saying. that's also something that's questionable. And like, I wish I had a lawyer who was willing to fight as well as information um, to help my situation. Yeah. Um, so I was completely oblivious to all of it. And one, one thing you saw is really good at is keeping the athletes in the dark. They don't For give sure. you any information they have. There's no like legal president like you have in the regular court system that says like, here's the evidence we have. Both sides get to see the same evidence. Yeah. If you saw it has evidence, it's you saw it as evidence and the athletes on their own. You For don't sure. get a lawyer. You don't get any support. You don't get any help. You're on your own to fight your, your battle. And yeah. like, it's really hard to figure out what to do next and even how to get things tested. Yeah. Um, so, but one thing with my September sample, which I didn't realize this until after the fact, is they tested it in, in September. Yeah. They closed it. They kept it. They reopened the A sample in January to retest again. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then that A sample they tested in September didn't match the A sample that was tested in January huh. um, because they did a different kind of testing for it. Um, I don't know if it's because they did a different kind of testing or if it was tampered with after the fact. And, um, and then my B sample was retested. I watched the B sample be retested yeah. and that was matched the second A sample. How but did you the watch the B sample? Did you have to go? I, I went to the lab. Yeah. In LA. Wow. Um, yeah. Which is interesting because like, there's no oversight there. Like yeah. anybody could easily tamper the sample in that lab. No, no questions asked. Wow. Like, and there's two people in the lab who are off the boat from Eastern Europe, which they could easily be bribed. I know how that shit works too. And that yeah. happens. Anybody who's watched Icarus knows anybody from Eastern Europe can be bribed. So, so I'm going like, to be honest with you for a second. Yeah. I saw yeah. Mark's like post, like when yeah. all this shit came out, I saw Mark's yeah. post and like, I got like halfway through. And when I started seeing the Icarus shit, I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Like, why was he, how could he be comparing this to Icarus? And then I, and then I started reading a little bit more and then I started thinking a little bit more. And yeah. now that I'm listening to this, this is fucking mm -hmm. crazy. Like this and is that's the thing. <laughs> and that's the thing. And this is the shit I can't talk about because like, technically I don't have proof. Yeah. And if you don't have proof, you have nothing. For sure. But this is what I've seen. I watch yeah. my B sample be opened in the lab. Yeah. Like nobody's there to watch. Like the amount of times the woman in the lab from Eastern Europe tried to get me to leave and walk away was like every 30 seconds. You want to leave? You want to leave? Do you have to take a break? I'm like, no, I'm going to fucking power through this because yeah. like, I'm not leaving my sample for six. Like I'm here for six hours watching a fucking like chemistry project. It's like, wow. I can handle it. I can so how handle did the six B, hours. How did the B sample test? Does it, it, it just matters if one's positive, yeah. it's positive, right? It doesn't yeah. matter what the B does. So the B matched the second A sample. Okay. And the second A sample was positive. Was positive. They both, they both matched positive. Yes. Okay. But like the first A sample was negative. Now, and so if the so, B sample would have been negative, would that have changed the game? Or yes, it would have completely went? changed the game. Okay. Yeah, if the B sample is negative, it all goes away. But okay. what gets me is the fact that I didn't realize they can test the A sample twice because, like, it was opened, it could have easily been contaminated and closed back up, or it could yeah. have been opened the second time, contaminated. B sample opened, contaminated. Like, none that's of that. Interesting. That's interesting yeah. that you say that, but because before all this came about, um, yeah, I, when I was getting tested in, in T town. There's a, yeah. there's like a little checkbox that you can also check to like have your mm -hmm. sample be used multiple times or something yep. like that. Like, Oh, for research. Yeah. For research, research. purposes. And, um, and then, yes. um, they also tell you that they can also open it at any time to test yeah. for, for a second time. And the yeah. way I'm hearing this, it sounds like your mm -hmm. A sample was, was it tested three times or was it only tested twice? Am I it was tested twice. Okay. Twice. Yeah. Cause yeah. I, I, 
to my knowledge, they can only be tested twice. Yeah. And it, and it can be tested at any time. And that's what they kept repeating and saying. And honestly, okay. it's crazy, like, mm-hmm. you know, hearing this and it's like, mm-hmm. Now I, I probably will never let them use it for research. I just think. That well, that's the thing. The funny thing you say that because yeah. like, so for that test, it was odd because like the, you know how they use the iPads to do all the data. Yeah. So the iPads were either down or not working, whatever. But like my DCO used just the paper method yeah. that day. And like, I always click use my sample for research. Yeah. Like every time. But that time he, he checked off the box. Do not use it for research. Huh. And like, I was looking at the paperwork and I was like, oh, I don't give a shit. I don't feel like starting the paperwork all over again, just because yeah. he checked the wrong box. Now in hindsight, I'm like, huh, I wonder if that's the reason why my sample was not thrown out and opened again Wow, is because I didn't say, yeah, throw it away or use it for research. Wow. Um, but that was the only time I've ever not checked the use it for research box. So okay. that's interesting. So I'm like, that's also something that I question, but there's so much of the process that I question and it's like, maybe it is legit test. Maybe I like, I mean, I had Costco beef from Costco the night before as well. And like, yeah. that's all hormone raised. So like, technically like it could have been beef from Costco that was contaminated with hormones. What are they saying you tested positive for? Cause they never really make that clear in the USADA thing. Like, uh, no, they a- don't that one guy, cause like, usually it's like down to the number, like GW 15, 16, 75, <laughs> you can like look yeah. it up and you find out yeah. that it killed 60 yeah. rats in China, <laughs> you know, when they tested the shit yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So what, yeah. what did they say? It just says anabolic steroid. That could be anything. Exactly. And that's what they told me too. I didn't find out that's what, what I they actually told you. That's what told me. Yeah. Metabolites of testosterone. And I was like, yeah, well, what is it though? I still don't know what it is. I have no idea what I tested positive for besides exogenous anabolic with metabolites of testosterone. I was like, yeah, so what is the beginning part of it? Exactly. How do you, how can I prove my innocence if I don't even know what to search for? Wow. This is, yeah, this is wild. Like I'm, I'm, I'm like, my mind is blown. And so we're just going to move on. Like it's happened and you're probably at this point too. It's like, it's happened. It's done. Unfortunately. Um, Well, that's the thing is like, what gets me is the fact that I'm a clean athlete. I followed all the rules. I did everything right. And yet it's just completely out of my control. Yeah. And now I suffer the repercussions of now I'm like labeled as a doper. My reputation's yeah. ruined. I have a four year sanction. I can't get a job in the sport. Like I can't coach. Like there's so many things I can't do. My life is ruined on something that was hundred percent out of my control. And like, if yeah. I could trust the testing, I would be like, okay, that's fair. But like, I can't trust the testing after doing like the behind the scenes ITA stuff, not trusting the sample Behringer bottles, like it could be completely tampered with, or maybe that is hundred percent coincidental. And I ate beef the night before that had hormones in it and it, it tested after that. But like, yeah. I don't know. And the fact that I know I didn't take anything, I can't prove it. And it's ruined my life. Like something's wrong with that. I, I can't be the only athlete who's going to deal with this. Like if the testing is, is that sensitive where it's now going to start bring about positive results for anybody who eats us beef or beef that's raised with hormones. Yeah. Like our nutrition, our food society in the U S is not good enough to, to beat that test. So like, yeah. I can't be the only one who's going to suffer from this. And it's like, if you can't, if you're going to ruin somebody's reputation and livelihood and potential to maybe compete at Olympics or world championships or what it is four, five, ten 10 years down the road, you need to know hundred percent sure this athlete did this intentionally. Yeah. Cause I think, I think Maddie but Godby, they don't. Yeah. The sprinter. She dealt with this. She was in, but it was in like yeah. South America. She actually ate yeah. some beef and they actually, I think that how they proved it is they tested the coach as well. Yeah. And it was like, but like, yeah, but yeah, again, they probably did that in a timely fashion. They did five they months did. later. Yeah, like, how am I going to find an answer five months later? Especially, and and that's like, the that's the it's other ridiculous. thing. When it's ridiculous. It's unfair. Because when you go back to that, um, they don't really try to help you. Because like I would think that nope. they would go, well, this is where it could come from if it came from somewhere, right? Nope. And they can't do that. Um, well, that's the thing is, you saw it as everything in their power to make your life to make it impossible to prove. Yeah. Um. They because it looks like they're doing their job if they can. Well, because they need positive tests to keep their job. They need yeah. positive tests to keep their government funding. They need positive tests to look good. It's kind of like comparing to a lawyer who's a DA. Yeah. A DA needs convictions. You saw it as the same way. 
they don't give a shit about the right answer. They don't care about throwing a clean athlete under the bus. They need positive tests. And if then they're so kind of on their high horse pedestal about how great their testing is, they don't believe it could be wrong. Yeah. Um, and- so that, and the, I have a whole issue with that too. Yeah, no, that's, that's, in, yeah, that's wild. And so like diving into kind of the next bit, and this is kind of, this is going to be a hard topic to talk mm-hmm. about, Okay. Uh, but it's something I feel like definitely needs to be touched on. Mm-hmm. You, you got an email says that you're yep. positive. You can't sleep. You, uh, you were running around like chicken with your head off. Mark's probably even going like, man, what did we do? Like, what did we do wrong? Yeah. Like, did I do yep. this to her? And like, yep. um, yep. brands, you've been working with Trek for years. You've been working yep. with all these companies depression had to set in your mental health <laughs> like i'm serious like you had to be oh my god and you're, and you're being so sweet on this podcast you're smiling you're <laughs> you're being really strong but i know mm-hmm. like you you had to be torn to bits and like mm-hmm. how did you how did you do it like how how did you go through battle like I, me as an athlete like i am nowhere near your stature and I worry every day the CBD mm-hmm. that I take is going to pop up for THC. You mm-hmm. popped up for steroids. Yep. Yeah. And, that and I didn't and even take. Th- and that you didn't even take, that you don't even really know what the <laughs> fuck it was. No. Nope. But you know, like, I bet you're getting hate mail. I can only imagine oh, the shit. fucking hate mail that you're getting the, the, from yeah. some fucking 300 yeah. pound Jerry and <laughs> behind his computer that thinks he knows everything yeah. cycle cross. So, yeah. Yeah. How are you dealing with that? Like, how, how did you deal with that? Um, I'm still dealing with it. Um, the the thing is like, I was dealing with depression before this set in, like I was struggling with depression. I mean, Belgium was not easy this year. Um, it rained almost every day. (laughs) Granted, we had a really good group of people to hang out with. Like we met some good friends and it was a tight bit. We did dinners each week and it was really like, that's the only thing that actually got us through Belgium is the fact that we had some people who were close to us that we get to hang out with and, and it was a, it was a good time that way in that regard. Yeah. And that helped a ton, but I was dealing with that depression before. Um, and then I got that, that letter and like, it was awful. I mean, I've never had a panic attack. I had a first panic attack, wow. um, which I had no, like I re- I recognized what it was like after it was over because like, as soon as I like, you know, research panic attacks and what it was and symptoms. I'm like, WebMD. okay, that makes sense. That, yeah, yeah that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it was pretty bad. I, I mean, I'm still crying quite a bit. I'm yeah. still super sad. I'm still trying to process, um, just like mourning the loss of everything I've worked for, for 20 years. Yeah. Um, it's definitely not easy. Um, I started taking antidepressants, um, I probably need to talk to a therapist, but again, no, you it's just expensive. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. You um, do. I, I know. And, and that's, but a lot of it was, I don't have a choice. Like I've got a mortgage to pay. Like I started school, like the things I had to do just to survive. Yeah. Um, if you think about like, I lost all the contracts, you lose all the money. Yeah. You don't have a severance. You can't collect unemployment because you're you're self-employed as a sure. professional athlete. Um, like, there's so many more stressors besides the USADA stuff. I was like, what are you going to do for money? That was the big one, especially when you've been a professional athlete for 20 years. You've got no skills and you've got like a 20-year yeah. gap in your resume. Yeah. Like, it's real hard to find a job that doesn't suck um, when you've been a professional athlete for 20 years. Yeah. And that's um, all, you know, that's all, that's all, all I know. All yeah. Know. And it's not, it's, it's not a marketable skill. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not very marketable. And like, and same with Mark, like being a mechanic, a bike mechanic, like we were successful. We did, but nothing we have is marketable and we yeah. graduated college 20 years ago. So also there's a huge gap in the resume. Um, so just trying to figure out a job. And then it's like going back to school, paying the lawyer, keeping her just, kind of just putting one front of the other one foot in front of the other and like making like one day at a time. I started yeah. drinking a lot. I'm still trying to work on not drinking so much. Um, yeah. It was definitely, uh, it's been hard. I'm still struggling with it. Man. Um, and I think and that's, yeah. uh, thank you. Like, seriously, thank you for being vulnerable. Um, 
in, in, in admitting to that. I mean, I know Mark did a post and, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, that's just one thing I really wanted to touch on just because, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully I have trolls listening to this fucking podcast. Seriously, they, right? They understand that you're, <laughs> you're still a human being, whether or not you did it. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I'm just going to, I'm playing that biased devil's advocate, whether yeah, or not yeah, you did enough. it, um, you're still a fucking human being and it's just a bike race. Um, yes. your, your life is not like you don't deserve to die because you fucking <laughs> ate, you, you know, whatever. I don't care. Um, and you matter. I think you, yeah. that needs to be said yeah. and you and yeah. Mark both. And, yeah. um, but yeah, that's fucking heavy. Um, that is, that is really, really heavy. And, uh, it's almost as if your world just kind of collapsed around you. So as far as brands mm-hmm. go, mm-hmm. I know that there, there used to be a clause, like if, if you got caught doping, you had to pay mm-hmm. back prize money between those. <laughs> so did you have to do that? St- well, technically, yes, but I didn't win anything. So this is like, this is like the, the funny, ironic part of like reading through the acceptance letter I had to accept from like yeah. USADA for the yeah. four year ban. So yeah. it mentioned like all the USOC support, all the USA cycling support, like all this like government funding support. I was like, <laughs> well, I was laughing because I'm like, there isn't any support. Like, yeah. what am I going to do? I'm not losing anything on that front. Like there's no yeah. USOC support. There's no like USAC support. Like nobody gives a shit about cyclocross. Yeah. Um, and so like, there's nothing. And then I didn't win any prize money. Like I didn't win it. I didn't get any results. So it's like, I think it's kind of ironic, funny that like, I get a lot of stuff taken away from me, but I'm just like, well, I never had that anyway. So the only thing yeah. I'm losing is my reputation. And that's what I was fighting for because which like, is, which is massive, by the way, that's worth which is more pretty massive. Money. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Well, honestly, like I kind of look at it as like everything I've done for cycling, I've poured my like kind of heart and soul and passion into bike racing and getting people on bikes and the fun part of it and like doing everything like pro cycling for so long yeah. I just feel like at this point, this is like, this is what I get back. Yeah. No, After everything sure. I've given, I'm just like, wow. That's it. That's it. That's it. Well, uh, so, yeah, like I, that's I, where I, I am. <laughs> I think it needs to be known. And, and while I am, I'm, I'm, you know, I was trying to do this podcast from a, a, a non-biased review i think on my biased yeah. opinion um yeah i think i think you should know where i stand in the sense that you know i, I love you both and i think yeah you did great things in the community um i w- i was dealing with some depression in europe with going to world mm-hmm. cups for months and i remember you telling me that i needed a vitamin d lamp um <laughs> i looked into it i never actually got one um because i didn't yeah. stay there long enough but yeah. uh but yeah, it's, it's a fucking thing. And so I can only yeah. imagine, you know, what you're dealing with and what you're struggling with and, and guys, anybody that's dealing with depression, it's a serious fucking thing. And so mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. a lot of people, a lot of people will fight for mental health on the internet, but they'll also be the first ones to troll, you know, quote yes. unquote dopers and, yes. and they'll troll yes. other people and tell yes. them to go kill themselves. But it's like, yes. you gotta be fucking kidding me. Like there's well, still humans, you know, ironically, <laughs> this is where I've gotten. And like, so one of my classes for the summer like I had to do an assignment on depression and I was reading like a bunch of stuff on depression. And I was like, huh, I've got nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 of the symptoms. Maybe I should go get help. But then what kind of really pushed me over the edge is that I was talking to Mark and we're talking about depression. We were having like one of those heart to heart. I was having a full on breakdown, yeah, like ugly crying type discussion. He was trying to help me. And um, what was it? I was like, yeah. I was like, well, people don't think about killing themselves numerous times during the week. Yeah, I know. He's like, that's... he's like, no, that's not normal. I was like, come on. Like, yeah. I'm not going to do it. But yes, I think about it all the time. Yeah. And he's like, no, Katie, that's, you need help. For sure. And then I, I, I called the doctor, I think the next day, or I figured out Good. a way to get medicine the next day. Cause I'm just like, oh, I thought that was normal. I thought everybody. Yeah. No, well. and, and then I had that, I had actually had that conversation <laughs> with my wife as well. Like yeah. we were talking about like suicide and we had actually had a friend who committed suicide and yeah. he was like noticing that I wasn't really that torn up about it. And it's like, well, like it's, I'm, I'm torn up about it. Like it, it yeah. rips me to bits um, yeah. and it's heavy, um, yeah. but I know what that person was feeling. And I, yep. I, the only difference is I've never really tried or like mm-hmm. I've thought about it all the time. Like, I mean, yep. like everybody does, you know? And I think mm-hmm. I even said that. And she said, no, everybody well, doesn't. Thing. 
and that's the thought I thought everybody like I have it. I would totally know the exact way I would do it. Yeah. It's just that I won't because I know how many people care about me. I know my, yes. my, it would I'm kill my them. parents. I'm yeah. one of them. Yeah. yeah. I know we don't talk a ton, but I'm one of them. But you know? it's one of those things where like, and honestly, this whole situation, it really is how many people care about me. I yeah. was actually joking to my dad the other night. <laughs> I was like, at least I know who's going to come to my funeral. For like sure. so many people reached out for me, like people I haven't spoke to in 10 years, but my number's still on their phone reached out to me. Yeah. Like people on Instagram reached out to me, like so many positive people who have my yeah. contact reached out to me. And I was like, okay, so people do love me and do care about me. So it's like, maybe that's not such a big deal. <laughs> well, I think, I think that's why, yeah. that's another reason why I wanted you on is like, I yeah. think the op- those people reached out because they wanted you to tell your story. And I, I want you to tell your story yeah. to yeah. these people, to my listeners and, right, right. and whatever else, and just give you the opportunity to be you. And then, um, mm-hmm. but like one last question and to finally wrap it up, it's uh, with, with the brands and you don't have to name any of these brands. Yeah. Um, yeah. But how did that end? Did that end? Did it end just like your friends or did they kind of chalk you up and chew you up, spit you out? I don't want to name the brands because <laughs> I don't want one. I don't want to give them the time of day if they, if they did just right. chew up and spit it right. out. Right. Two, I just kind of want to know how that went down. Like, because I'm yes. assuming you had to talk to everybody individually. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, they've all been super supportive. Okay. There wasn't one sponsor that was just like, want to throw me under the bus. They all believed in me. They also being super supportive. They've actually all been really great. That's good. Um, but they have to protect themselves too in some, exactly. some scheme of things, which is totally understandable. Yeah. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So it's like behind the scenes, all my sponsors have been super great and supportive. I don't yeah. know what they've said like publicly because I've just not read anything. Just avoid any negative troll stuff. I just mentally can't take it. Yeah. I don't think I've seen um, any, any of your brands actually. That's why I asked. I don't yeah. think any of your brands have reached out or made comment. I think it's because they're like, if we don't talk about it, it'll just go away. <laughs> and they're not wrong. They're not wrong. I, in some regard. Yeah. In some yeah. regard. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, I get it with like the whole doping issues in cycling. I get it. Like I understand the whole process of it. And I understand having to like kind of step away and, um, you know, keep everything positive and PC. Um, so I understand it sucks, but like behind the scenes, um, all the sponsors have been supportive. So yeah. no, that's good. I think you yeah. made one comment too, that you would never be like welcome back in the industry as like a, like just coaching or whatever the fuck, you know, like, yeah, in the industry. yeah. I, I don't think that's true. First off, I think, you know, we, yeah. like, look, at, look at who's in our industry. I mean, like, fuck Lance Armstrong has a better podcast than, better you know, honestly, than anyone, right. I really enjoy Lance's podcast. Like there I don't listen, go. I don't, I don't Dude. listen to like the tour podcast, but his like, uh, the Ford podcast, yeah. that one was good. I don't listen to bike racing chicks. I don't care. Like bike yeah, racing boring. does my head in that stuff's really, boring. I don't care about bike racing, Yeah, yeah. but like the interviews he does on the Ford podcast with the people he interviews, they're great. Yeah. And see, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, yeah. I do think there's a space for you in the sport, but I, honestly, if I was you, I'd be really hard pressed to ever come back to the industry, even if the industry wanted me because of the way of how easily you were chewed up and spit out. Yeah, I do feel. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's like um, actually one a guy messaged me on Instagram and he was the kindest, sweetest, supportive, like it was a really good interaction. Yeah. Um, and he just pointed out because I did that, um, podcast with, uh, the SUPA podcast, like the day after my, ever the news was po- like, um, public. Yeah. And he's like, it was good. He's like, except the fact that you're such an inspiration to so many people and like just walking away from a sport that like loves you and cares about you. And like, you put so much effort into, he's like, you can't do it. You got to stay mm. to kind of keep, keep like the people who love you, like, um, just, I guess like a, just have me self say in the, yeah. in the world. And part Which of is me selfish like, I, of us, by the way, it's <laughs> selfish of us. I, Cause we feel yes. like we need Katie here yeah. for us to go on and yes. be happy when in reality, <laughs> like, Hey, I'm going to be honest, like after hearing yeah. you and almost like, yeah. seeing, like you held back some strong tears there. Um, but and, thank God for fucking Lexapro. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Like I have literally been crying every single day for yeah. six months. 
fuck. And now with Lexapro, I can at least keep the shit inside. There you go. Lexapro, <laughs> I will be sending you an invoice for this ad. Okay. Um, but Seriously. but honestly, honestly, you held it back there. And yeah, you know, I saw a photo of you doing what you're doing, and I want to talk about that. You're in okay. school now. Yeah. Um, you're smiling. You were in school smiling, and now it might be an Instagram versus reality situation. But you were smiling, and I think that's fucking rad. So what are you doing? So I just finished my um, nursing assistant program. Okay. Um, I took at the community college here. I took uh, a CNA program. So I'm just I have to sit for the state exam um, in like a week and a half. So okay. that was a little bit put off because of COVID. We have to do a, a written test and a skills test. So um, that took a little bit longer. But like I was doing uh, clinical rotations for the nurse assistant program and did like rehab facility, um, long-term care facility. And then I did five days at um, our ho- local hospital here was a level one trauma center. Okay. I did like an acute care clinic. So you uh, ICU, um, progressive care unit, med surgery, um, surgical care. Like it was quite a bit of uh, kind of hands-on acute care. Um, and I loved it. I did, there were like three 12 hour shifts, the best thing ever, five 12 hour shifts, whatever it was. Um, but like I left after 12 hours and I'm just like, I don't want to leave yet. I'm enjoying this. I'm learning so much. It's exciting. It's different. Like nobody cares. I'm a bike racer. Like it's a totally different world. Yeah. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows knows, KDF and Compton. Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Like, can you do the job? Um, can you help the patients out? Um, I just really liked working as a CNA, like granted it was clinical. So it wasn't obviously it was still school. It wasn't actual work, but yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's like the first time I've actually felt a sense of accomplishment and success in years. Wow. And like the first time I've actually felt joy doing anything. That's and I'm awesome. just like, I don't need bike racing. That's I don't awesome. care. And like, I don't remember the last time I actually enjoyed a bike race. Um, wow. So, you know, it's, it was definitely not the way I wanted to end my career. Um, I wish I could have ended my career on a happy note and just been like, sweet, I can move on and do something else and still keep my foot in the um, bike racing game if I feel like it. But, you know, that didn't work out the way I had planned, Yeah. but doing the working as a CNA, I like that so much more. No, that's Um, awesome. I think that's amazing. I think, yeah. Like I said, I mean, to see you smiling after and now, mind you, you'd been dealing with this for six months or whatever yeah. you know, prior. Yeah. And so you've had a little bit of time, but I know yeah. it can't get any easier. Even tomorrow, it's still going to be lingering. And honest. Internet, yeah, it's actually, well, I don't look at the internet. So like, Good. I don't look at Twitter, um, my Instagram, like if people sent me negative comments, I just deleted it and blocked them. Didn't respond. Yeah. Um, anybody who's reached out, anybody who knows me has my contact. Yeah. Um, but like Twitter, I haven't looked at Twitter. Like I'll I was shocked you responded quickly. to me. I'm not going to lie. I'm shocked that you <laughs> responded to me. Cause I was like, I don't know how she's going to take this and want to do this or yeah. at all. Well, I, don't know. I pretty much what I want to do is just kind of get the podcast media stuff. Like I want to yeah. get kind of my version out there and then just be done with it. Yeah. Um, because like, it's kind of like, peeling off a bandaid when the wound is almost healed. Yeah. Like I keep on like, I keep forgetting about it. And then everyone's, then I get an email from somebody like, Hey, can you do an interview? And I'm like, sure. What's one more. I already hate myself so much as it is. What's one more fucking day of hating myself. No, I hope, I hope you didn't feel like that on this podcast. I hope you did not feel like that. Um, no, yeah, not like, always just, just most of the time. <laughs> good. Okay. I, Cause that is not one way I want you to feel on this podcast. Never. Yeah. Um, no, no. <laughs> like, like I said, I'm so thankful that you came on Katie and we got to do the infamous last question, which okay. is if you could have a cup of coffee, um, or a cup of scotch or just a glass of scotch <laughs> or just anything, what, yeah. who would you have a cup of coffee with and dead or alive? And okay. why would you have a cup of coffee with that person? So I actually put a quite a bit of thought into this and I really couldn't think of somebody. I I feel like there's an answer to this that I should be like giving some smart, clever answer. But honestly, what I would love to do is either have a cup of coffee with Tina Fey because I love her and she's hilarious and she's smart and she's talented and she's an amazing writer. Um, And I think 
she would just be fun to hang out with. Um, and I would love to have a margarita with Chelsea Handler. Like okay. I'd love to get drunk with Chelsea Handler and then have a cup of coffee with Tina Fey. So, and I so think that would Chelsea? be perfect. You don't know Chelsea Handler? I don't. I, you oh my could, gosh. Like, you probably could, you probably could tell me and I'd be like, Oh, I know who that individual is. She does. She used to have like um, her own show, the Chelsea Handler show. I think she has a podcast and okay. she's a comedian and she's a writer. She's written like two or three books. How um, old is she? She's probably, I want to say in her late forties. Okay. There's a girl that I listen to that is a comedian that does a podcast uh-huh. and I've never seen what she looks like and I don't really know what it is, but it's funny. She interviews people that I like. And so that's um, why I listen to her. I don't know if it. it I don't know, name. but but she's just a, Google. Yeah. I'll, Google, I'll Google Chelsea it. Handler. Like yeah. people should know who Chelsea Handler is because she is right. hilarious and she's fun. And I just love like her outlook on life and her personality. So I think yeah. getting drunk with her with margaritas <laughs> would be super fun. Well, that's and another then, reason why I ask yeah. these questions yeah. is because I start learning people <laughs> that I should be having drinks with or having coffee with. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah. but no, that's awesome. I, uh, yeah. like I said, Katie, I, I can't thank you enough and I wish you and Mark the best. And, and yeah, it's cool to see you smiling, doing your new thing. And, 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 the selfish bit of us in the cycling world does, does, yeah, we, we need you. We want you around. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you need to do Katie. I think, I think you need yeah, to do. And I think I'll yeah. come back around. Um, cause I love mountain biking. I love like riding with friends and yeah. the social part of it. And I still love riding my bike. I just need a minute with the whole, I just need a minute with all of it. I think you do, you do. No, no, no. Like you do, you need, you need that time. And, take that time. I think, uh, yeah. take that time and respect that time. And yeah, like learn to, y- you only knew bike racer, Katie. Now it's time for nurse Katie and real life Katie, <laughs> which a lot of people are scared of, you know, nobody. And then I think that's why cyclists <laughs> fall flat on their face and they're like, Oh, I want to like put one foot in cycling and one foot out. So like, I can always come back if I need to, cause yeah. it's safe. It's comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I I'm, I'm stoked for you. I think you're going to do amazing things. Thank Period. you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to like the new chapter, new life. It's just, whew, it's been a, uh, it's been a tough process. Yeah, it's been well, a process. I would not wish on my worst enemy actually. Yeah. No, Seriously. again, <laughs> again, thank you so much for being vulnerable, for being honest and just telling your story. And this is, that's what this podcast is going to be called. It's going to be Katie Compton, her story. I think that's the name of it. I don't want perfect bullshit clickbait. Um, <laughs> like where it's like, is she a doper? Is she dope? <laughs> Believe we me, ever like, know. <laughs> like your true crime podcast. Yeah, it's like the amount of times I listen to Dateline, I'm like, oh, that person definitely did it. And then I'm they like, maybe they did it. <laughs> Who knows? It was the cow. <laughs> Who knows what it was? You Who know? knows? <laughs> yeah, and so, and that's the thing. Yeah. We'll never know. The, we'll never you, know. And that's the problem. Like, yeah. My friends and family know me and believe me because they know me. They know my yeah. character. They know my moral like outlook on things. They know my stance against doping. Um, they know me. It's just the people on the, you know, the sides, like the armchair experts that like think they know what they're talking about, but in reality, they've never stepped a foot into cycling world. For sure. Ever. They're, they have no idea how it works. They would never yeah. talk to you face to face even. So that's another nope. thing too. So like, no. Nope. Always remember that they'll send you a message with the most hateful, crude shit, but they would never even look you in the eye and even say, Hey, so I think nope. that needs to be known. But anyways, trolls, yep. if you are listening, I do want to <laughs> let you know that mental health is an actual fucking thing. People are humans. Uh, she's not just a bike racer guys. She, uh, I'm has- not a bike racer at all anymore. Well, there you like, go. I don't even ride my bike. I like run. I've been trail running, but you haven't seen me on the group ride in how long? It's like, it doesn't has, even happen. It has been a while. It has been happening. But uh, yeah, like I said, yeah. you have feelings. You're you're a human. You're a tough chick, but you I have, have so feelings. many feelings. You so have many feelings. feelings. <laughs> and you're allowed to feel them. But anyways, guys, yeah. thank you so much for listening. If uh, you haven't already, please make sure you hit that subscribe button. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye.